There we go. We're recording. Just recording or live streaming? No, we're just recording. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so there we go, people. Today, Fanny and I interviews. I'm Fanny and I. I'm interviewing Nuance Bro from Nuance Bro, YouTuber, non-partisan, over 150,000 subscribers and over 120 videos, trying to get to the truth no matter where it leads. Thank you very much for accepting my invite and welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Obrigado. <laughs> ah, there you go. You know more Portuguese words? Training to go to Brazil at some point? I know, I know, I know some bad words. I know like caralho and porra, <laughs> things like that. But that is normal because I, when I learn English, of course, everybody knows that the dirty dictionary is the one that we learn the first in all languages. That's sure. totally normal. <laughs> totally natural. So I have seen you like talking about Timpu or with Timpu, Ben Shapiro, Jod Jordan Lee, Lee Peterson, and going after TYT. Jesse Lee Peterson, I think. Sorry, yeah, Jesse Lee Peterson. Uh, going after TYT. Uh, recently doing coronavirus videos six days ago and uh, a lot of more content. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how did it all start? Where did you come from? Like, how did you become the ones, bro? Yeah, so it was a little over two years ago. September 14th, uh, 2017 is when I believe I filmed my first video for the what became the Nuance Bro channel. Um, I went to a Ben Shapiro event at UC Berkeley. I'm from the Bay Area, so UC Berkeley was really close by. I was coming back from a, uh, from a trip, and I actually scheduled my trip specifically so I could come back for this Ben Shapiro event. And, you know, I had a camera, I got a microphone and I was like, you know, I just want to go talk to people like these people who protest some of these events. Like I was just curious how they think and function. And I wanted to ask them because I had some questions. I'm like, you think he's like this, but like, what about this? And I just wouldn't ask people. And it kind of started from there. And my first video went semi-viral. So then I was encouraged to make more videos and it just kind of went from there. But I always thought I was always interested in doing some sort of sort of uh, YouTube videos, potentially political for a long time. And I just always put it off. But then I was like, you know what, let's just give it a shot. And uh, it seemed to work out. It does. I'm a big fan and I love your videos. I honestly started when you were just like doing the interviews and I came back to watch those and I was like, is that video the first one with the young, skinny, drugged <laughs> Jack Black? Is the one I don't know that about skinny, should... but... <laughs> uh, skinnier, I would say. <laughs> but was that when you picked the nuance? Because he says, like, nuance, nuance. Oh, like... you mean the, the skinny guy who said the nuance thing? No, that I actually had... That's why when, I, uh, when he said the word nuance, I was like, nuance, like, that's a good word or whatever because i already had the idea in my mind to name the channel nuance yeah. bro or the, the funny thing is originally i i named the uh channel nuance news but when i was going between nuance bro and nuance news but in the title of the video i wrote nuance bro so then people were commenting in the in the comments they were like so is it nuance bro or nuance news because your channel's named nuance news but in the title like in the intro of the video you wrote nuance bro and i was like crap i'm like well i might as well just change it to <laughs> bro then because i did that so yeah i kind of stuck with that ever since it, and became natural and it's, it is a more natural expression for people to use so it's easy to to catch <laughs> so a lot of things trends guns wall constitution what is the what is your the normal conversation like? Is that something that you do all the time in between friends or just when you take the microphone and go outside to interview people? Oh, no, this was a part of my life for the longest time. People who knew me would probably describe me as very argumentative or political and things like that. I, I'd always like to challenge people, get into discussions, arguments with people. And a lot of people just aren't comfortable with it. I noticed that a lot of people just aren't comfortable with arguments. I love it. It's like the battle of ideas. It's fun. It's, it's like sport to me, the same way people enjoy watching 
football, I enjoy having sort of political conversations with people. So, uh, and, and it's hard to find a lot of people who identify with that in my everyday real life. So the, the YouTube channel has been kind of a blessing because I've been able to find a lot of like-minded people who also like talking about these sort of sorts of issues and like hearing about these sorts of issues. So uh, it's really been a blessing in that sense. I completely understand because I was always the one that is like, I can't believe people just keep talking about the weather, you know, everywhere <laughs> you go. That is just so yeah. difficult. And people are just complaining, you know, like, oh, it's too cold. It's too hot. Oh, it's too rainy. And it's like, okay, can it change the, the subject? Okay, let's talk about somebody's life. And it's like, that's not where I'm oh, trying yeah, to go. Oh, yeah, the gossip, yeah. You know? <laughs> or so popular for example in brazil and i was like i was mm -hmm. so out of the boat all the time you know like i was just like i'm not part of these groups and even my friends i always had more boyfriends than girlfriends and even my friends during university were like okay we think you should have some girlfriends and go hang out with those girls and i would go and they're like, okay i I can't stand much longer. Can I come back? And they're like, okay, did it's you like have them some, talking like, you know, is just nails, nails on a chalkboard. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I do like those. But the problem is like, I'm not really into like going shopping, walking around, you know, to shopping to just look around on the windows. So it was just like out of the box all the time, you know, having more like a other level conversation. And like we, me and my husband, we like always like, come send messages to each other about like, did you see this new, did you see this new article or something like that? That's good, <laughs> you find like-minded people that you vibe. <laughs> it's difficult to find people like that. And that like to talk about things that make people uncomfortable, it's even harder because at the beginning I was about some subjects to say like, yeah, yeah, I'm an atheist, but I don't want to talk about this because I know it makes people uncomfortable. I have been at that situation and now i'm like you know what i actually like triggering sometimes just to open the conversation <laughs> now you know like be give it throw a big throw on the twitter and then to have some reaction and then you like and then you can go back to the normal level like okay let's talk honestly and speak about this you know epistemologically trying to find the more accurate point and and i think it's all about nuance and yeah i did not say like look at my shirt you guys go check the <laughs> merch go get your nuance bro shirt and <laughs> and go outside and talk to people about things that make people uncomfortable that's how we find solutions <laughs> true what is your opinion about trump and the elections 2020 is gonna win this year oh man uh it's all over the place right now especially with uh, the whole coronavirus situation it's very volatile uh i covered this because i'm i've started doing twitch streams very recently like i just did my second stream yesterday first stream was the day before that and i've oh, been I covering the I'm white gonna house go check yeah, I've been covering the White House briefings uh, that have been happening every day because there's been a lot of funny stuff in some of those briefings. So I was like, we got to cover this. Uh, I think it's interesting. And I try to give some news before those briefings start. But I was covering some of the polling that was dealing with, you know, either Trump's approval rating or people's uh, opinions on how he's been handling the coronavirus situation. And some of the polling is just crazy. Like I saw one from Gallup which granted, this is the most extreme one that I've seen, but it was showing Trump as far as his handling of the coronavirus situation at plus 22. So it was like approved 60, disapproved 38 as far as his job handling the coronavirus. That's pretty huge. And not only that, but it's affecting his overall approval numbers as well to the point where a bunch of polls that have never had him net positive on approval ratings have finally moved to net positive on approval ratings. So a uh, lot of interesting developments there. Plus, Biden is clearly declining cognitively. It, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say that either because it's kind of sad. Because yeah. I would make fun of it at first, but now when I see like how bad it's getting, it really kind of makes me sad. And it reminds me of you know certain people in my life who I've seen uh, who've suffered from old age and just dementia and things like that. So yeah, yeah. it is sad. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but uh, Trump gonna win 2020, and uh, it, I don't think it Corona would matter much, you know. Of course, Corona actually end up 
I was afraid of the corona and the financial crisis coming after would mm -hmm. affect the election and Trump's, you know, uh, approval. But uh, so far, it is, uh, it is, it has been good. And I have followed through you. I have seen that through your channel, in fact. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty much like, I'm not Trump supporter. I could not say that. I'm not even uh, in United. I'm not even in the United <laughs> States. American, I'm not a yeah. voter. You know, it, I don't know if this could be considered like a foreigner collusion or. I was going to say foreign interference in our election. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me talking about Trump so much, but <laughs> but I think what people should be talking is about politics and and the policies itself and in results. And I just don't see much credit much credit given to Trump for all the good things he has done. And I and I think that is the bias of uh, of a lot of people and the media, the mainstream media, because if it was any other president that had done what Trump has done so far, it would be like, you know, fi uh, fireworks and co celebrations. Well, wait, do you have like specific examples of like, like maybe the top three policies that you think he's Implemented well, I think, think, the, or... I think his policies on taxations that actually clearly influenced influenced the un, the employment, you know, and the low in, in unemployment. Uh, well, I mean, the employment, the unemployment rate was going down before Trump uh, got into office, and yes. it's basically maintained the same trajectory uh, since he got into office. Plus, you could argue the tax cuts, even if it benefited us economically but like fiscally it could it's kind of a disaster in the sense that our i think i think it, i don't know maybe it could be a wrong belief in politics but i do believe giving leaving more money on the hands of the people it heats up the economy in general so sure but if you're not making subsequent cuts in the government you're just ballooning the deficit as well like in a sense you're almost you're doing deficit spending by cutting the taxes and not cutting anything else, which is what they've done. Yeah, that, that that's so far. I don't know what they could have improved or make it better. I mean, you would have to cut entitlements. That's really, I mean, and plus he increased the defense budget by hundreds of billions. But, but of I do would, but I would say like, like what I know what he has done good, it's very shallow in comparison to everything that it's bad against him, you know, like I do recognize some things that I personally don't like. And I and I would say that's probably just because I would like a smaller government in general. <laughs> I, I Sometimes I go back and do my political compass that I don't know if people do that, you know, time to time. But I do that because funny enough, I find myself moving in the graph a lot, you know. And I was much more leftist before <laughs> and much less libertarian. And uh, yeah, I have crossed the line to the right side, <laughs> but I'm still very close to the center. And uh, I don't think there is any political model of nowadays that uh, resembles to what I envision or what I mm. would like to see. You know, I would like well, hence to the uh, the nuance party. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, why that's we're part why, of the nuance party. That's why we have so much in common because I do think uh, we we should be walking towards the smaller like a, as much as I can. I interviewed Adam Kokesh recently, and uh, I'm very it's all familiar about with that. And I'm not, and I and I know I cannot call myself a total libertarian because I still. I am for still having nowadays, you know, I don't think we can go through like a, a complete revolution to like a, to government, to no government. So I still believe That's in what Adam wants, small yeah. government and not I'm not an anarchist is something that <laughs> so yeah. it <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> what is your political compass or how, how you you define yourself? Oh, <laughs> oh man. See, even asking myself to define myself as a disaster, I just, I usually just tell people, just take me issue by issue. And if you want to talk about that, you can try to get a general we need sense to of do where your I'm political at. Political compass together. Let's do the political compass together. Oh, One no, thing. it's going to take too long. <laughs> and then you Plus, can talk it, it also depends on what website you use. I've noticed each some of them. question like, opens so much discussion itself. I, I, I realize sometimes I'm like, okay, you're supposed to not think much. And then I just, marked as I, I I read and marked whatever I think at first and then I have a big discussion after that 
with whoever yeah. is with me about like how I do not even agree with the question and sometimes how the question is broken by itself. Yeah. Okay, 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 this 100... doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of times I look at the questions that they're asking, and to me, it almost paints like this sort of binary view where it's like you can only support this or that. Even when you press that more button and it gives you more options, I'm like, my option isn't in there. Why? And it bothers <laughs> or me. Or some oxymorons that does not feel to fit in the same sentence at all. Like one party, one party government is better for democracy, you know, because it reduces delays or something on the process. And I was like, well, I don't even think one party it's democratic, you know, if it's one party government. <laughs> Well, I think so they're it's saying like, like moron. <laughs> no, I think they would say you pro I think they mean like if you have choice, but if there is a one party that has majority rule, like, uh, yeah, no, I understand in that point. And uh, it, it's not necessary, no, like, I, it's always like I, it's really hard for me to be pushing on this strongly agree or strongly disagree. Yeah. More in the end, when it's more like a uh, social. I'm more towards to push this strong, but in the political, it's I'm very more nuanced and more moderate. I would I say. I feel it, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, racism and criminality. You have talked about this with Jesse Lee Peterson, and another meeting about regarding uh, regarding abortion and homosexuality, and. Uh, what do you think is the problem with the discussion that divides, like the polarization of left and right in this type of discussion? Was there a specific one you want me to focus on? That's a lot of stuff right there. <clears throat> oh, I think it's just because of like the idea of like the left is more liberal and you have people that are like conservative to to say like we need those morals and those values. We have a lot of this discussion in Brazil because of Bolsonaro come with the, oh, the family and almost a little bit anti, you know, LGBTQ and those rights that I don't think need to be crawled over normal rights of people. You know, I, I don't think, I, I for example, my idea of Black Lives Matter and even LGBTQ is like, I think our laws protect people in general. So you don't need to make specific laws for black people or for LGBTQ because they are protected under the law already. And sure. I mean, there was definitely a time where those laws didn't protect those people. And there was definitely a time where those laws actively discriminated against those people. So um, you're still going to have vestiges of that in our politics where people still feel that's the case. They would say maybe it might not legally be the case anymore, but still like sort of socially and in some ways politically, it is the case based on, you know, X, Y, Z, like, oh, if this gay person can't buy a cake from the baker, now you're taking it, you're bringing it into the private sector, it gets a little dicey. It's like, okay, do, do are my, uh, fr is my freedom of religion rights more important than your right to be able to purchase a good like anybody else? It gets complicated. Uh, I would take the baker's side in that. But um, yeah, I think it's hard because when it comes to some of those divides, a lot of it uh, is sort of uh, religion sort of coming into the fray and people's conceptions of what's the right way to organize society. Is it more around the family? Do some people believe more in the sort of nuclear family structure, whereas other people believe in sort of more of a communal sort of structure and they don't think families are all that important? A lot of those same people also have family problems. Funny enough, a lot of them if they don't have good relationships with their mother or their father, they tend to have this more sort of communal aspect to what they believe. Like this, uh, it takes a village idea that Hillary Clinton puts out, which isn't totally bad uh, in, in itself. But um, yeah, like, like on homosexuality, some people are just, just totally against it period. They think it should be outlawed. And then there's like another aspect after that where it's like, okay, well, whatever you do in your own bedroom, that's one thing. But should the state necessarily recognize marriage, then you move another way after that. It's like, well, sure, you should be able to get married. But 
Um, just don't spread this sort of idea as if it's like it's okay and comparable. I think the problem is when he gave the. I think the problem is when he gave the state the right to give people marriage certificates. It should be something like it's more like private. You can just go to whatever church or whatever lawyer and notary and do your papers and but you know and get married and it's not something that the government needs to give you a certificate. And and yeah, one of my arguments against like libertarian view why you're making <laughs> government so big and <laughs> just give yeah, them Ron Paul used to say that all the time. He would say like why is the state even involved in marriage? That should be something that's involved between you, your spouse and your church. Like it should be more of a private contract if you're talking about sort of for legal tax purposes, just call it civil unions. But at that point, it's really sort of a distinction without a difference. Um, but then, like I was saying, I was doing the general progression about like how people might be sort of like anti-gay versus like going towards the mm -hmm. other side of the spectrum. After the second or third thing I mentioned, uh, you would go to something like, well, it's okay if you're gay and even if you're married and things like that, live your life. But we shouldn't be sort of spreading this uh, to children. Children are impressionable and we could potentially harm them and change their behaviors in ways that they otherwise wouldn't have um, changed and this could be harmful to them in life and you know don't do child drag shows at libraries and yeah, things like and that. Yeah and again it's another thing we should not be giving the government the right to educate the kids sexually you know should be like something that is more private like the family decides how it's going to do maybe there is such a government uh, public health uh, um, let's say like some informations that the government should pass to people or educate people in regarding public health and maybe that should be done through giving the education to the parents and then they find the best way to pass to their kids instead of like oh yeah i'm gonna put like you said like there's no need for a drag queen to give classes teaching kids masturbation or you know or that there are different is that happening how many the, different the genders they believe you know uh, uh this discussion has been gone through Brazil as well because we have like a minister that is super evangelic. So of course she's not going to be for LGBTQ rights, uh, but uh, also we don't want papers going through schools educating kids graphically about you know sex stuff that maybe they don't need to learn in the school, for example. <laughs> Well, I have no problem with education in schools, whether that be, you know, sexual or otherwise. Like, maybe we could argue about what age they learn that at, okay? <laughs> but I do think if you're in school and the job of school is education, then you should learn all types of things that are, you know, important. Yeah, I'm not that against that. But the support. problem is, like, I, I know they have done or tried to do that through UK, for example, try to educate kids to try to normalize uh, homosexuality and the families that they are trying to target because you know that western families don't make a big deal and point to gay people and say like hey, look that is bad you're gonna get sick if you touch we don't do those things but they were trying to target more west uh, more families that come from middle east and those families specific have their freedom of religion and their right to take the kids out of specific those classes so they were targeting targeting these people and they were not even fulfilling the pur purpose because those people were already withdrawing the kids from those classes with their religious rights. Yeah, it, it gets dicey when it's like, okay, well, what if there's a culture clash or there's a religious conflict where it's like you have your personal religious beliefs, how much of a right do you necessarily have when you know, your kid's education might brush up against those religious beliefs, you know, it, it gets a little dicey there. And that's a lot of those are kind of questions that courts have to figure out all the time. I don't know 100 percent necessarily where I always stand on those issues. But I would say, listen, if you're going to send your kid to public school, yeah, you're paying your tax dollars for it for it. There's going to be some ideas that your kids are taught that conflict with your religious beliefs. Either withdraw your kid completely from the school or don't try to change the school to, con you know, kind of, uh, you know, conform to what you believe for everybody yeah. else. Um, that's kind of what I would say, but yeah, generally I don't think we should health. be forcing these sort of things on kids as far as, you know, child drag shows and homosexuality. I, I don't think that should be kind of pushed onto 
kids. It's a little bit on the public health and the kids on school on public schools and vaccination. I, I, I don't think we should force vaccinate anybody, but I think it, some people should have the right to like, okay, you, you have the right to bring your kid to school, public to, to the public school if you vaccinate your kid, and we're not going to force you to vaccinate. But if you don't do it, I'm sorry, you're going to have to find a private school that take your kids non-vaccinated and not put other kids in harm or in danger. Yeah, that's another dicey one. It's, uh, it, it's hard. It's hard sometimes to balance uh, liberty with safety and, you know, the well-being of others. It, it, it gets complicated because a lot of times those ideas conflict. What do you think about the corona, uh, the political decisions coming, you know, about from because of corona, but coming from higher like governments and forcing people or the level of like putting people in prison or, you know, lockdown? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of people who are concerned out there with government overreach and, you know, authoritarianism and saying like, you know, the government shouldn't have the right to close businesses like this and harm your, you know, your living and all that stuff. And to some degree, I think that concern is legitimate to some extent. But at the same time, I think those people need to realize, you know, you won't even have a business if, you know, if there's like, for example, we have a war, they have to raise taxes for that war. And, you know, there could be enemies who are about to land and, you know, drop nukes or whatever. Like, there's all kinds of things. It's like, if you don't have a government that could help fight back those types of things, well, you wouldn't even have a business and you wouldn't even be alive and blah, blah, blah. So you, once again, it's, it's this sort of like, if there's these exigent circumstances that are happening, you need to take care of them. Life is not always going to be this sort of like rainbows and butterflies all the time. There's going to be times of national crisis and we do need to come together at those times. And, you know, you can't just have a government that's always bogged down by bureaucracy and these types of procedures when there's a very, very fast paced moving situation uh, that's wreaking havoc. So that's why emergency powers do exist. That's why, I mean, the, the, even the founders like took this into account. There are such things as emergency powers. So um, I'm not concerned with like martial law for the next 20 years and they're just using this as an excuse to get the black helicopters out there and do mind control on the population like i don't believe in that i do think it's a real crisis and we're just trying our best to fight it and uh it is that that's that's just the case yeah no i understand i i just got a little bit scared yesterday i saw some videos of like really the helicopters going on the beaches in brazil trying to push some sand on people that try to come out of their house for <laughs> and because actually in the at this moment in this crisis and isolation people go crazy like i'm used to this i do this for like uh, for almost four years yeah. that i live at home and I try to be productive and do this, talk to people, connect. I, I learn how to connect more online, you know, and I made it a routine. And I do have my routine at home to keep productive and don't go and not go crazy. But I understand people get quite some time to adjust. I took four years to do it. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of extroverted people who are having people a People will time. not need to adjust because they will not spend this much time in the isolation and they should be using the time to not go enter panic or go crazy and use the time because I've, I always heard when I was working or going outside, I was all friends like can't wait for the weekend or some vacations to have this time to do this project. So now you have all the time, use it, you know, yeah. go get informed, don't get stressed. That's bad for your immunity and use your time productively, you know, but uh, and it, it is it is important to to talk about all these problems. And I think the corona came as like a, it's not. Of course, it's worse than the flu. It, it is very scary to have everybody getting sick at the same time, and that is the problem. That it, even if everybody got sick, we would not all die. That's important to say. And mainly if we can spread the in time, like everybody gets sick, but please don't get sick in the same two weeks. 
<laughs> you know so there is a lot to talk and of course i i just don't like the idea of people going crazy in their house and like no i cannot even go out because the police is going to police is going to get me and arrest me or send me back home when you actually when everybody should be uh talked to saying like hey keep isolation try to keep distance but if you are going crazy at home yeah go outside it is it is okay to go outside okay and try to keep a distance and instead of have like a like that, those situations, I saw people trying to just come and sit on a bench on the outside. You know, you see people are stressed, and then the police comes with guns. It's like, you go home. It's like, what? That is really scary. That is really bad. And yeah, Brazil government. If you look at the political compass of government, they they are really high on the authoritarian. You know, I always talk about how like they could they can just spread the message and not harm people with the message. You know. Or like, I'm going to harm you if you don't follow my message. I'm going to put you a fine or, you know, put you in jail if you don't follow my recommendation. That is the line I don't like to see being crossed. But uh, yeah, they uh, people still say like, oh, Brazilians are just stupid. They need that to be protected by themselves, ne- from themselves. <laughs> and that is it's sad. It's condescending, I think, is... I don't know. It's complicated. <laughs> it's a lot of philosophy and politics is really close. Uh, other people I saw you discussing and talking about is uh, global warming, climate change, when you talk about uh, Candace Owens' appearance on Joe Rogan experience. And I really like, uh, I, I, I liked Candace Owens for a very short amount of time, just for a few <laughs> views that she has. But as soon as I saw she was so, so got smarter. and intolerant yeah. as you know, other people that I don't like, I just stopped following her. But I still uh, look up to her because, you know, I I recognize that there's a lot of work and interviewing and it's serious. And I always try to be, uh, imagine that everybody just wants the best. So there is nobody like really evil thoughts, thinking to make bad things to anybody, you know, even if like sometimes the decisions are not good. <laughs> But everybody just wants the best and we should be able to talk and then change our mind and get into the nuance. (laughs) So uh, what are your views on on this, on the global warming specifically? Yeah, global warming is not an issue I talk about too much. I think a lot of people, again, it's like I, I, I hate this idea that I'm perceived as some sort of like radical centrist or it's like I'm always on the middle on some issues. But the thing is that the tribal nature of our politics usually gets people to adopt polar opposite extremes on an issue when there's grains of truth to what both sides are saying in a, in a sense. I mean, there's people who just think it's not happening at all. It's total BS. All of it's BS. And then there's the other side. Oh, my God, we're all going to die in 10 to 12 years and we have to do a 96 trillion dollar bill to change every building in the United States. I think both sides are ridiculous on that front. Um, I don't think it's as pressing as an issue as a lot of people make it seem where they blame every single wildfire, every hurricane, every everything, every drought uh, on global warming. But I think just generally it's a good idea to get off of things like fossil fuels, move more towards nuclear and renewables, which is another thing these global warming people they're all about getting us off of fossil fuels and things that produce, you know, carbon emitting. They're, they're just they want to reduce carbon emissions, but then they won't go towards the the cleanest form of energy in a sense, which is nuclear. Like when you look at the footprint, how much space it takes up versus how much energy it produces and how much waste there is and how much of that emits carbon, the whole process. Nuclear is one of the cleanest energy forms there is. And they're just crazy hippies about it. And then they think, oh, my God, Chernobyl. It's like, dude, you, you don't understand anything about like the science and how the technology's progressed. And like when you look at the amount of deaths associated with different types of energy, nuclear is by far the safest. But I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's an annoying one. I try to stay away from it for the most part because a lot of it's just sort of like this cultish belief a lot of times. Did you do anything, talk anything about Greta specific? 
Greta Thunberg? Uh, I don't think I did anything about her. I think a lot of people who are doing videos like bashing her, it's just kind of like, okay, they're just hopping on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, she's a kid, whatever. I don't really care that much to talk about, uh, you know, a little kid like that. Um, did she bring anything new to the conversation in your opinion? She doesn't have to. She's a kid and she like, it's not even her bringing anything like people are using her for their own agenda. That's really what it is. Like, she's a kid. She just wants to talk about something she's passionate about. But then all the people around her are the ones like shoving her in people's faces. So I don't really care uh, about. I, I just try to ignore it. everyone who's giving her attention is really like the problem there. I don't. Yeah. I don't care. She's some kid who didn't go to school. Like whatever. I could go. I could not go to school. Actually, uh, I had a bunch of people bashing me down like on Facebook when I made comments about and say like, you're a doctor, how can you do that to a, you know, a sick kid? And I was like, that's why I'm talking because I think she is being psychologically abused, you know, to being you to be used like this, to be taken as this totem, as this hero. And of course, she's going to be attacked because there is nothing original that she's bringing to the conversation to regarding climate change and global warming uh, i have heard of this and we have been aware and trying to do things you know make different measures since wow decades ago when she was just a baby and i've heard of that and that's one of the things i was like even talking to family friends that you know i recognize and re I, I think they are like a really into this discussion for the best of everybody, but uh, that did not think hard about it. It's like, what is she bringing up original? It's like, they go, well, yeah, just her condition. That is her, is the shield, like I said, she is a shield of activists. Yeah, I mean, I don't think people necessarily need to bring something original to the conversation, but, you know, it, it, like if you're just saying the right things, it doesn't have to be original, it doesn't have to be new and novel. Uh, as long as you're saying the right things. But to me, Not it's just like, like a, well, she's more of a spectacle than any uh, Like a extinction of species. And it's like, wow, so many have passed through, you know, like it's something that's kind of natural. Um, <laughs> at least in, when talking about species being extinct, I'm like, well, it's bad. Yeah, it's sad. It is, but it has happened. And it happened to dinosaurs and so many other species. Why we're looking, we're overlooking that. Or even like, I don't like the message talking, making people hate itself. You know, like, oh, we're humans, we're so bad. It's like, no, we're pretty awesome. We're always trying to fix problems, you know, and help other species and help the environment and fix the damage we cause. I don't think we're that bad. I think we, there are bad samples. You know, we are able to be good and bad, but uh, there's no such a, a thing like a villain or hero, like in real life, totally. <laughs> yeah, and the, the problem with some of that language is it could potentially go into things like eco-fascism, which then those people like to push back against and say, oh, that's a little too far then. So you have to really, you know, you have to be really careful with some of these sort of environmental, uh, environmental topics. Yeah. <laughs> There are no like, there are no like really cool conversation nowadays more than talking about the weather and the gossips. If you're in your clan, you know, like that's yeah. we were all about this. Uh, what do you think about another things you try? You you actually everything I'm talking here is just like things you debunk. You debunked was like global warming and Black Lives Matter and. Uh, other myths like uh well, i didn't debunk tax. global warming i was kind of uh it was more of like a video debunking candace owens or just showing that she didn't know what the heck she was talking about but, yeah yeah no that was uh, yeah it was just a discussion over here but uh, there was like black lives matter, matter debunked and other myths that like pink tax or feminism yeah, yeah or Ben Shapiro, uh, yeah, that that we we we've mentioned the uh, what do you, yeah what do you think about the systematic oppression or systematic r racism or like that uh, police brutality is systematic uh, or racist driven? Yeah, I mean, 
once again, there's truths to both sides or whatever sides people take on this issue. There's, there's truths on both sides. It's just, I think some sides say, oh, there's no, you know, historical systematic, you know, or even direct racism anymore. That's all overblown. That's nonsense. Someone like Jesse Lee Peterson would say that he actually doesn't believe racism exists or it ever existed. That's what he says. Yeah, I know. I've heard I think, in the okay. Um, he's just like, no, it's just evil. It's and amazing. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but then there's other people on the other side who think every sort of problem that has to do with, you know, why sort of African Americans or the community is where they are at large is because of systematic racism and direct racism and everything's just racism. And it's like, you don't think there's any issues within the community that cause even maybe 1% of that problem. Like you don't think there's any responsibility to the individual or the community or any of that. It's all external forces. It's this really sort of bogus populist notion that makes people feel good because they can blame someone else for their problems. And I think I don't think that helps anybody. But I do think there are there is actual racism. There is actual historical racism as well as systematic. Well, in a sense, systematic, like it, it's not like historical racism and systematic racism are necessarily mutually exclusive. Sometimes they can be like one in the same. So one, one thing I mentioned uh, when I was doing an interview with Jesse Lee Peterson, I didn't get to really expand upon it that, that much, but uh, it's this idea that sort of th this sort of uh, the history of racism is still with us today and we can see it in the data as far as how people vote. So not even how uh, blacks vote, for example, but in areas where there was a higher proportion of slaves in a given county, like we can measure this on the county by county level, that we can predict how the whites in those areas are going to vote based on how many slaves were there in 1860, which is really crazy. Um, so it, it shows that like a lot of these things haven't changed in a lot of part of the, in a lot of, uh, in many parts of the country. And it's just something to take note of and be cognizant, cognizant of. And um, yeah. It's, it's not all gone, but it's also not all bad. Like to say that we have more racism today, even though there's like a lot more issues, for example, with single motherhood in the black community, to say that's the result of more racism compared to, you know, the 1940s or the 19 or the 1860s. Like that's ridiculous. Yeah, I think the the race, the systematic racism is something that maybe, like you said, has happened in the past. Throughout history, we got rid of, like, for example, to get to abolish slavery, you know, was like a move, a step forward to against racism. And of course, there were the laws that kept improving on, like even marriage, you know, in between people of diff marrying black people, for example, or other things, and in the social level, took longer than the laws. And I think that is kind of like natural evolution, you know, sometimes because the laws were more authoritarian. But I think it's interesting that people try to push like those anti racist laws nowadays that would be like just to ban words that I don't agree with that. I think that is very authoritarian. And don't recognize that as like, we, it's like, what do you need to call the system racist? You just need one police individual that is racist and or do some some bad police act towards a black person and then you call him racist and then you can frame the whole association and call it systematic. So I don't believe there is systematic racism today as I don't believe there is a systematic uh, prejudice against LGBTQ people, but I do understand that you can we can find, we are 7 billion people. <laughs> of course, we're going to find examples of individuals that are racist or that have prejudice against these people, and maybe we're never going to get rid of individuals, you know, like with those views in, in society in general, but I don't think we can call it systematic because we have people, some people with that it's uh and is is I don't know what do you think <laughs> well I think I think it's a little more complicated than that I I would say you could make the argument like I was making before that there is systematic racism it's just not necessarily as 
uh, it's just not as prevalent as some say it is. And it, it, like I said, it kind of meshes the term historical racism with systematic racism. So, for example, if you have a system that was set up during a historically very racist time and those those institutions still exist today, it's still like sort of it, it still has some of those uh, the vestiges of that racism still kind of exist today. Like that, like I I showed how it sort of manifests itself in voting patterns in certain areas of the country that still exists today. Um, but then so, the part, the, you think the cultural thing is like, because what I think the other part to what you said was about the family, the structure of the family, for example, that is something that is cultural. I think to recognize that pattern, to some it's extent, not but racist, like, yeah. you know, I think that could be an explanation why black people are more involved with crime because they do not have a structured family to have the idea of authority of a father, for example. That is a, an hypothesis. But And I think it makes sense. And I don't think that is racist to understand and address this problem, you know? Sure, but cultures don't stem from a vacuum, right? They're shaped by environment and history and all kinds of things, right? Like, where does American black culture come from? It's not like it just... You know, it's not like some rap video came from the sky and just like created black culture in 1980 no, or something. No, I think they are more tribalist and they have that type of culture of like. Well, the I, I, I would don't speak in the families and the moms well, have. But, the, from but look at fathers. Okay, but what were what were the marriage rates in the black family in 19 uh, in 1950 or 1940? It was way higher. It was comparable. Oh yeah, no, but even now better it's, than it's white families today. by the times. You no, know, like the culture of nowadays that people don't need to engage in into long term relationship. It's so easy to just have I don't know Grinder, Tinder, or whatever app, and change. You know, well, I don't think to, Tinder and Grinder destroy the know. black family. Necessarily. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like it's easy. Like the 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 communication nowadays is so much easier. Like when uh, it changed a lot. Like I have gone through a lot of. The change because I was like before we would like just meet people personally, and then when the internet came, we had the ICQ or other things that we would like. Okay, now I can meet people from the other city, and then yeah. But I think the black family was being destroyed well before like the internet and you know oh, online you dating. Oh, just the politics uh, pushing onto. How how does it work? Can you can you tell me? It's it's complicated. There's no one answer. That's why I, I don't like yeah. when people try to break it down and try to pick one factor. It's multifaceted, of course. Uh, we saw a lot of these problems come about during the Great Society programs uh, in the 1960s under people like LBJ. Uh, a lot of these welfare programs where it was literally required, like if you wanted to get these sort of welfare payments, and they came knocking on your door, you had to make sure there was no man in the house. These kinds of things do shape culture, creating sort of uh, section eight I ghettos. I did not know they had this one. Cultures. Yeah, this is to this, check these the things. man in the house. I did not know that actually. Yeah, that is it, it, it's definitely a thing. And then you had the sort of uh, because in Brazil there is a lot of this. You know, it's one of the things I talk against the populist policies to give people money or to say like, oh, if you poor, come say that you don't have a job. And because this cha change, like you said, reshaped the culture in Brazil. People were like poor and hard workers, and now they are just poor <laughs> and lazy, <laughs> kind of. Because yeah. it was what the the incentives, the political incentives. Cr create and uh, yeah please tell me more about it <laughs> yeah they i mean when you incentivize something or you subsidize something you get more of it thomas Sowell used to talk about this stuff all the time back in the the 80s and uh things like that it, like you your government can have an effect on culture uh you know we can even see it right now happening in real time with with the response to this coronavirus Look how fast you could take societies that were super warm with each other, shaking hands, hugging, kissing, and all of a sudden everyone social distancing. Like these can have effects in a short period of time that last generations potentially. So, I mean, you, you see this in data when you look at areas of Africa, for example, where people were enslaved and taken from those areas. When you compare those areas where, you know, we haven't had slaves taken from those areas in, in hundreds of years. But even now, generations afterwards, many generations, those areas still have less trust towards outsiders 
than areas still in Africa that didn't have that history. So, like I said, history and, you know, policy, all those things shape how people behave generations down the line. So we have to be cognizant of that. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I, I just like there are some conversations on Black Lives Matter that I have gone through and over and even being called the white supremacist and I have to always point I'm not I'm clearly not white so I'm not I, to start just but I know now they say like it doesn't matter you can be any color you can be white supremacist and now I always try to defend the whites on the point is like it, all this fight that the black lives matter to do against whites specific sometimes just saying like oh whites is late as a whites colonization you know and I was like you know that the whites did not just come by Africa and then create slavery. People were enslaving each other there. You know, it's like one of the things I always like try to point like whites did not create slavery and did not come and just kept, you know, grab people and put them slave and brought to. And by the way, the whites were the ones that actually abolished slavery and there are a bunch of brown and black people that still slaving each other nowadays so i don't think there's much even related to racism or colorism what is what a what a term i think this is the most racist term ever created because it's like the racist black people don't want to call themselves racist and then they had to create a new term to call themselves because they yeah. cannot recognize they are just being racist <laughs> You know, I have suffered from a lot of racism from black people because in Brazil they think racism is only against black people. And black people can call whites crackers and Japanese make jokes of us, of Japanese. So I suffered a lot of from these jokes. And I was the one that like, shit, and I cannot call them black back or I'm going to be the racist here. This is well, I covered this <laughs> on my stream the, the other day, actually, because we were talking about the coronavirus and how um, Asians are getting discriminated against uh, because of this. Like, and they were trying to shape it and try to make Trump look like the bad guy for why these things are happening. But I was showing these attacks, like especially like the violent attacks, and almost all of them that have been reported or even recorded on video that are documented have all been pretty much black people attacking Asian people. And nobody wants to talk about this because there's this idea that oh, only white people can be racist or something like that. And I think that's total garbage. Uh, because if you do look statistically at hate crimes, even, for example, which they don't like to you know, prosecute non-whites for hate crimes, but in, even when they do, disproportionately, blacks are committing more hate crimes against people than white people are, for example. And nobody wants to talk about this. Even in polling among blacks, Blacks think they themselves are the most racist group, which this has been shown in polling as well. And it's something that people just don't want to admit. I can say uh, myself growing up in the city of San Francisco, most of the racist comments or actions that I've seen have been from the black community, whether it's against myself or against Asians, Hispanics, white people. Like it's almost always been or the sometimes case. Sometimes against own black people. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. I had worked like as physician working in the off in, in, in the hospitals and it's so diverse and then I had had black nurses that have told me like I will use the, the word no problem. I don't like nigger. And I was like, I'm sorry, excuse me, which color are you? And she's like, Oh no, I, I just don't like them. I, I'm not like them. And <laughs> were they Nigerian but by chance? And I was like, What? And I was like, yeah, that's bad. Were, were they? Do you do you know if they were foreign or not? No, no, Brazilians, but ju they just make that distinction. It's just like oh, the joke of uh, is is a little big on the joke of of. Uh, so they are foreign. They're Dave, Brazilian. Dave, you said. Dave, 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 Dave Chappelle. No, no, this when I was working in Brazil, there are a lot of black Brazilians okay. that are honestly speak out their racism that they don't even you know. Like they're like, oh yeah, my family is fine, but I'm not gonna even date a black guy, something like that. 
I was going to say, because in America, especially, there's this idea that, well, it's actually kind of true that a lot of the foreign blacks, like people who come in from Nigeria, they don't like American blacks because they look down on them and they think they're, oh you know, bad and things like that. It's very, it's very common. Uh, it's a very common thing. It's interesting. Yeah, the racism, uh, what I just think is interesting the way that we highlight only races against blacks and when how we overlook all the other racism that exists for example like like you said like when they are like from different or origins like i'm brazilian japanese brazilian so i'm like not brazilian i do not make part not be part people look at me and to see that I am different. People would knock at my parents' doors to like, we've never seen a Japanese baby. Can we see it? <laughs> like without even knowing that. <laughs> this in 85. And I was like, uh, <laughs> they were not like in an area where there are more Japanese. But if we go back to Japan or even in Brazil, where there is a bigger community in Sao Paulo, the capital, uh, my sister has had trouble and have to like hide date boys that are more Japanese because like both parents are Japanese and they yeah. would not accept my sister because we are half full. And we oh, know 100%. You go Japan, if you go to Japan, they uh, even you know, worse. People in America might see half Japanese people as Japanese, but they don't see you like that in Japan. They no, see I'm... you as a half full for sure. Japan's kind of racist. <laughs> It's pretty racist and and yeah, to even like their own and it's like going to other areas is even worse. But uh, no, I my father is from a city where it was a you know a, a colony in Japan, uh, like a colony from Japan in Brazil, and they have all the mixes. I have a Japanese black friend, like from like a Japanese mom, black father, and it's quite different. It's quite a it's strange mix, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but my, 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 I have cousin that now she's already, you know, like generation that is half full, mixed with blacks and end up looking more like native, for yeah. example. Yeah. And here I would be mixed up with the, the Inuits or <laughs> in Canada. I have people have told me like to just go back to my country, whatever it is. <laughs> they cannot recognize whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. It's like, can you name it, bro? <laughs> uh, so yeah, and and that's something like you know, like some people look weird to my family, like my husband, white Canadian, with me, and then look at our kids, uh, our our daughter. We have been like in more religious restaurants where there are old people that really are against the mixing race stuff, like old books. And they like, mm, you know, like two funny faces. And <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> white supremacists. Have you been called white supremacists? Do you have you been have you suffered from cancel culture or anything like that? I mean, I think almost anybody who isn't just like a straight up like yelling in people's faces communist gets called a white supremacist at some point uh, on the Internet. If they're on there enough, uh, it's going to happen. It doesn't mean anything. It's just people yelling. I mean, there are actual white supremacists out there, which is unfortunate because then when you call everyone one, then the real ones can hide among the group of just normal people who get called that. And then it's like, OK, now you can't even deal with the problem of actual like people who are racist or hateful and all that stuff so uh they're making it a meaningless they're they're taking out all the force of that word it's just meaningless at this point do you think uh, by your experience on going on protests like have you encountered many of what you would believe it would be like professional protesters like being paid to be there and they don't even know 100 <laughs> percent yeah I mean, How if you watch my videos, I've literally sometimes even done things where I'm, I'm like, oh, I saw this person here before and this person here before yeah. and this person here before. You'll often see like similar faces in some of these videos that I do in places like San Francisco because it's the same people. It's like these very small group. Some of them are professionally paid protesters from whatever organization. Who knows? George Soros money. I don't know. <laughs> but uh 
yeah, you notice these things. And it, you know, at first it kind of caught me by surprise as well, because I was like, do these guys just, are they professionally paid protesters? Like what's going on? Like there aren't more people in a city like San Francisco who are more politically active to get involved in these things. And it's always the same small people. So I don't even go to a lot of these things anymore because it's the same people doing the same things. I try to focus more on like mass populist movements. Like if it's, oh, wow, there's like 20,000 people at a mass protest or event trying to show solidarity with some sort of issue or cause or whatever. That's more interesting to me than the very, very loud minority of the same people who have an agenda and they get paid sometimes or whatever. So the people that are being paid, they at least have the financial. And of course, the activists, when they really believe, they have reason. But uh, why? what do you think is the purpose of, you know, George Soros to finan finance this type of movements? Just well, to disturb I mean, the public? <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't 100% know necessarily, like, if they're getting direct checks or whatever. I know he does yeah. fund certain organizations that have these sorts of causes and stuff like that. But... I mean, I guess the incentive would be that he actually believes in these ideas and he wants to fund them and he has the means to do so. So why not? I guess, uh, you know, some people might read into those reasons as more nefarious than necessarily I would. But um, yeah. Yeah. Not not falling into the con great conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah, some people Try get to... a little carried away with some of these conspiracy theories. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> some people say, oh, look, he is Sir George Soros conspiracy theorist. No, more for our next conversations. Uh, we hit an hour already, and uh, I'm going to stop by here. It's really great so far, and just a lot of fun, and ple it was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. Please let people know how to follow you and get your merch. <laughs> sure. Uh, just look up Nuance Bro on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Instagram. Uh, I have my website, nuancebro.com. Uh, and yeah, that, that's it. Uh, I want to say uh, obrigado once again. Thank you for having me. Ginada, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And thank you people for watching. Leave your comments. Go check the channels and support. Buy the merch. Follow Nuance and get informed and get some nuance okay thank you very much see see you next time and kisses to everybody